Greetings, Dr. Mark Winton here from the University of Central Florida Department of Criminal Justice, and I wanted to uh, spend a few minutes um, uh, making some comments about uh, the um, course topics. And um, I think we're really at a juncture where we begin to integrate and synthesize more of the course material that we're, it, it's difficult for me at least to have these specific topics without integrating them with other topics. So if I'm discussing, for example, suicide um, bombings, gender becomes of interest to me as well, but also whether it's religious-based groups or non-religious-based groups. And so there's all kinds of factors that start coming together. And I think that's what we're, we're seeing. And, and certainly um, you'll have uh, a lot of flexibility in your papers to bring in the different topics that are of interest to you. Uh, I wanted to step back a moment though and, and kind of wrap up our discussion from last week on profiling terrorist groups. And I want to turn to a chapter by Gerald Post um, on political profiling. And this chapter uh, is from his 2003 book, the Psychological Assessment of Political Leaders, published by the University of Michigan Press, and the chapter is titled Assessing Leaders at a Distance, the Political Personality Profile. So one of the things that we addressed uh, last week and we continue to address, are we looking at a leader of a, a terrorist group? Are we looking at the followers of the terrorist group? Are we looking at um, the uh, society where the terrorist group operates, we're looking at the organization, terrorist group as an organization. And, and so um, many times we'll be looking at all these different uh, areas and, 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 and trying to understand how they are put together. So in looking at political profiling though, um, uh, Dr. Post has several areas that we uh, can incorporate into our um, political profiles and of, of leaders or profiling leaders in general, I think it's some very useful information. Uh, first, we can look at the psychological biography within the nation. And this would include evaluating uh, or assessing and understanding the culture of the, um, of the nation, the history, and then beginning to look also at the background of the leader, their education, their career, their relationships, uh, their experiences. And Post also recommends that we develop parallel, parallel timelines. And one timeline would have the key events of the leaders in the leader's life, and then the other one would have the key events in the nation. And, and of course, when you think about it, that makes sense to all of us, that we all live in a particular social environment uh, that influences us and that, um, you know, um, uh, helps us gain a worldview and how we perceive things, how we think about things. Uh, so the same thing we would do uh, there, uh, looking at the leader and uh, the nation. Second, we would look at the personality and assess the personality and, and, and look at such factors as their um, appearance and, and how they present themselves uh, to others. We'll look at their physical as well as their psychological health. Uh, their um, level of intelligence and how they think about things, uh, their emotional uh, levels and styles, and then look at what seems to drive them and um, motivate them for their leadership uh, role. And also, we would also uh, want to look at how the extent of uh, them being in touch or out of touch with reality which we know is uh, very important. Reality testing, uh, very important to look at. Third, we would look at the worldview. So the political views, the core beliefs, and the ideology as it relates uh, to the leader and the society. And then we would look at, fourth, the leadership style, the role of the leader, their interaction uh, with um, the public and the uh, others in their uh, social environment, how they um, present themselves verbally um, and what they talk about, their presentation of their goals and object objectives, how they respond to a crisis, how they respond to stress, 
and how they deal with conflict and also how they maintain support for their leadership role. And then finally, fifth, we'll look at the lead, we would look at the leadership outlook, the outlook of the person to try to begin to make uh, predictions. Okay, so that's very useful information I have found in my own research on profiling uh, uh, different uh, individuals. But also I wanted to, um, uh, and, and now I want to kind of move in a di different direction and just mention state terrorism for a moment. And again, I think state terrorism could fit anywhere in our class. It's kind of difficult to think, well, do you put it here, put it there, and or even state-sponsored state um, uh, terrorism, for example. You know, I had to go to the State Department and see which countries were on the list. And then, of course, you can look historically what ones have been on the list. And, and, and that, that, of course, um, is, is a helpful place to start. But also, we can look at other countries that are not necessarily or haven't been a threat uh, to the United States where this course um, is, is taking place um, would not be considered, uh, you know, may not be looked at uh, in the same way as uh, it would be from those that are being victimized by the state in that particular location. Um, and so you may find some debate, I guess what I'm saying is you may find some, some debate on, on what is state-sponsored terrorism or which states are engaging, which countries are engaging in um, uh, state-sponsored terrorism, or it is actually a terroristic state and is not just sponsoring terrorism, but is actually carrying out uh, terrorist acts. Well, one of the things I'll mention real briefly is a book I use in my human rights course, Human Rights and Wrong, Slavery, Terror, and Genocide by Dr. Helen Fine. I use this book in the human rights course, but I think I could easily have used it in this course. I could have easily used it in my genocide course. And, and so again, you know, in the beginning, I kind of mentioned similarities and differences between genocides and between terrorism and um, some of the debates that occur. There are a lot of people probably that study genocide don't focus so much on terrorism and vice versa. And, um, but then you have some that are like me and are totally confused trying to figure out what's terrorism, what's genocide, how do they interact, how, how are they different. And also I see in my own uh, research terrorism occurring before, during, and after genocides. And, and so um, uh, Dr. Fine's work was very helpful in, in, in those terms because she had, and, and two chapters I thought were of interest to what I just mentioned, and that is um, she, she has uh, uh, chapter four, which is uh, titled States of Terror in the Late 20th Century, Algeria and Argentina. And then chapter five is titled States of Terror Turned to Genocide, Guatemala and Iraq. That chapter title for me says it all. States of Terror Turned to Genocide, Guatemala and Iraq. I can tell you in my genocide uh, courses, I do not um, cover Algeria or Argentina. But I've had students before uh, write about the uh, Argentina and, uh, you know, the, that case study there. Um, but I do include in my genocide courses Guatemala and Iraq as genocides. So I think that is, is somewhat helpful as we begin to see that there's going to be different views on how we understand state uh, terrorism and also the, the variations with uh, genocide, ethnic cleansing, democide, terrorism, um, and, and so on. And that brings me to um, the, the um, article that I have linked, um, one of my own publications, Violentization Theory and genocide, and that appears in, appeared in 2011 in Homicide Studies, issue, um, I'm sorry, volume 15, issue 4, page 363 to 381. And um, even though it's called Violentization Theory and Genocide, it's really about applying Lonnie Athens' Violentization Theory to the Bosnian and the Rwandan genocides. And, and so um, I posted that because I wanted to present violentization theory first, and, and secondly, I wanted to focus on a comparative analysis 
And here I'm comparing the Bosnian genocide to the Rwandan genocide. So I'm looking at a more macro level, really. But also, I wanted to mention that I have other articles that um, uh, publish that focus on uh, individual perpetrators within uh, genocides. And so my research now has taken me using um, Lonnie Athens violentization theory and comparing and contrasting genocide perpetrators, terrorists, and serial murders and mass shooters. You know, putting all that together, uh, theoretically looking at differences and similarities and, and how um, this might be a useful uh, prevention tool, uh, an assessment tool, uh, and trying to understand where we're at or where we're moving to. Uh, how, and, and, and so there's a lot of, I think, um, um, useful policy implications with Lonnie Athens violentization theory. And then I wanted to mention, if you're interested in pursuing violentization theory, and um, some of you might think, wow, this is really something I want to learn more about. Others might say, no, I'm not that interested. Either way, that's, that's um, you, you know, fine. Uh, but I did want to mention, obviously, I mentioned this is my, my bias. This is a theory I use, and so I'm going to probably talk about it more than other theories because, A, I have more knowledge about it, and B, it's a theory I use. And um, anyway, if you have Amazon Prime, you can watch Why They Kill, The Creation of Dangerous Violent Criminals, based on the book by Pulitzer Prize winner uh, Richard Rhodes. It's ba basically about Lonnie Athens' theory. It's just an excellent documentary um, uh, put together. And um, um, what you'll see here is how the th theory works, really details by um, uh, several uh, researchers um, and uh, practitioners in, in, in terms of uh, um, applying Lonnie Athens violentization theory. So that's called Why They Kill. Um, and um, I believe it may also be available to rent on Vimeo. It was a while back for 99 cents, but if you have Amazon Prime and you're interested, you can watch it there. Or, you know, if you have friends or family, um, you can watch and, and have a uh, group discussion about it. And, and um, uh, I was uh, very happy to see the, uh, the documentary come out. Um, so I, basically, I don't even know what to call this video. I thought uh, course updates, uh, you know, moving on uh, to other topics, integration and synthesis. So I'll have to come up with a title, or YouTube won't let me post it, I think. Well, I mean, I could title it anything. I could, uh, you know, put a couple of, uh, uh, you know, just letters, and it would, it would go. But, but I think really what this video, the main purpose here is to just kind of point out and, and um, reinforce how interdisciplinary uh, this field really is. And, um, and so some of you may be, have an interest more removed from the areas I'm covering, which is fine. You, ha you can write about, if you want to write about counterterrorism, that's fine. I'm going to cover that a little bit, uh, but m not as much as if you took a course on counterterrorism, which of course uh, you'll find at any large university, um, but, um, uh, you know, security-based courses. But, um, you know, the whole thing is, do these theories apply to counterterrorism? Do the profiling strategies and techniques apply to counterterrorism? And, and, and so if that's your interest, by all means, um, you know, please feel free to pursue that. And, and so um, that, I think, is, is really uh, where we're, we're moving. We're, we're really starting to put all the pieces uh, together. And um, this wraps up this video. Thank you.